Hey guys, my name's Aiden Jones. I'm going to be on the online prosperity show today, talking about my childhood, talking about how I met my Colombian biological father for the first time in my life when I was 28 years old. And I've turned it into stand up specials on Amazon Prime worldwide, international comedy tours, and now a coaching business talking to corporate speakers. And finally, a podcast. You hear all about it on the show. Welcome back to the Online Prosperity Show, the place where we bring you the brightest minds and inspiring stories to help you achieve your own success. I'm your host, Prosper Tarawing, and today we have a very special guest joining us. Aiden, how are you doing, my man? I'm good, Prosper. Thanks so much for having me, man. Aiden, I'm, I'm already laughing. I know you're going to just really be uh, showcasing your talent to us, but before we jump into what Aiden does, um, let's get to know him a little bit better. You know, Aiden is a mixed race Colombian Australian comedian who's based here in Melbourne, and he's been spreading laughter and joy across the world for over a decade. Now, not only does Aiden captivate audiences with his hilarious stand up comedy and storytelling, he also shares his wealth of experience as a coach, helping speakers find comedy in their personal stories. In two, in 2022, he actually released a debut stand-up special called Taco, and it's on Amazon Prime. And he also has a podcast, Still Not Drunk, and that has become a top hit in Australia uh, since May of 2023. And today, we're going to delve into his journey and his unique perspective and how he's actually using his talents to empower others and um, help them be, do, and have a happier existence. Now, Aiden. Welcome once again. Tell us a little bit about your journey as a comedian and what actually inspired your interest in stand-up comedy. Oof, man, I want to say I've never had such a thorough intro. You hit everything, dude. They know everything about me. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like... um. I feel like that, um, that, you know, in, in eight mile, when the guy goes to say bad stuff about him, he hits everything first. You hit everything first about me. You know, you said it all, um, man. Um, so yeah, I've been, I've been doing stand up since I was 20. I'm 32. Uh, I started doing stand up. I don't know if you heard of Bill Hicks, American comedian. Absolutely. And, uh, yes. Yeah. So a friend of mine posted on Facebook one day, Bill Hicks's, um, uh, there's a documentary called American, the Bill Hicks story. And it's like, you know, he grew up in like a really strict Christian household in the American South in Texas. And uh, he used to break out of his parents' house when he was 14 years old. His friend had a car and they would drive down to the comedy club and he was 14 getting on stage doing comedy. And I always loved comedy. And I remember watching that as a 20 year old and being like, dude, if a 14 year old kid can do comedy, I can go and do comedy, you know? And uh, so I signed up to an open mic and I was doing it. I think within two weeks, I just, that was the first time I was like, oh, I can do that. I'm allowed to do that if I want, you know? And uh, like I was saying to you before, I mean, dude, I've been a massive, can I swear on this show? <laughs> it's it's I've, your I've, call, man. <laughs> I've been a fuck up in my life all through my twenties. I've been, you know, not being able to hold down like jobs, not being able to find something that I really love doing. Comedy is the only thing that I've ever, I just, I never have to try to keep doing it. You know, it's like a relationship. It's just easy. Um, So I feel really lucky to have found that so early in life and I've been chasing it ever since. Fantastic. So many people spend the rest of their lives searching for that one thing and, uh, um, you know, good on you for having found it at that very young age. Now, you mentioned Bill Hicks and how he had this whole street American, um, you know, heritage growing up. And that sort of then sort of triggered and inspired you to say, wait a minute, if he can do it, I can do it as well. My question to you now is, how has your mixed heritage sort of influenced your comedic style and maybe the stories that you are telling on, on stage? Yeah, totally, man. That's a great question. I mean, obviously the story of my mixed heritage has been something that I always come back to because the way that I do stand up is I, uh, I kind of notice what I've been talking about in my life. So like people go, where do you get your jokes, your ideas from? I always try and listen to myself. You know, you see a lot of people in your, in your week or in your month 
And if I notice myself telling the same story a few times to different friends, I'm like, that must be something that I care about. And so I'm going to write jokes around that story and then tell it on stage. Cause if I care about it, then I reckon other people will care about it as well. Cause there's themes beneath that story that are kind of universal and important. And something that I always come back to talking about ever since I was a kid was, you know, I grew up in Adelaide and I got dark skin and there's no, there's no like Latin American people really in like the, where I grew up, you know, there was no one. And people would always ask me, where are you from? Where's your people? I make a joke. I say people always thought I was Greek because everyone in Adelaide is Greek, you know? And, uh, that'd be like, bro, Greek dudes would come up to me excited. They're like, are you Greek? And I'm like, actually my biological father's from Colombia. And they would be like, Colombia. They saw you are Greek. You're Greek. Like, cause they have no idea where Colombia is. No one knows, you know? My nickname being Taco, because the first girl I ever kissed thought I looked Mexican because she'd never seen, you know, Colombia. She was like, Taco, and I wanted to kiss her. So I was like, sick, I'll be Taco, you know? Um, It's just something I've always spoken about. And I guess never having met my biological father, um, it's definitely something that impacted me growing up. And so it's always something like whenever I kind of am at a point in my life where I don't really know where I am, I'm just reminded of, does that make sense? I guess that, the yes, the, yeah. Sorry, yeah. The the fear or like the the feeling of being lost or not knowing who I am or whatever it is, whenever that comes up in my life, it just comes back to it. Always comes back to that. Fantastic, and that's a really good um, uh, j- journey that you've been there. But uh, it's quite surprising that people decided to call you based on the food um, of where they think you came from. So the Greek will probably probably call them sivlakis. C- c- um, the the Italians will probably call them pastas, and um, people decided to call you taco, and you. Yeah. actually then debuted a stand-up uh, special that you named Taco. Um, what what, yeah. what actually uh, was going on there and what can our viewers expect from that show? Um, so the show's about how I met my biological father for the first time in my life in 2019. So the story is, is that I uh, am mixed race because my mom, a white Australian, was backpacking in South America when she was 22, came back to Australia, found out she was pregnant. That's me. Never met the guy. He couldn't come to Australia because of the visa situation. And so they just decided to never like to not have any contact. And then I was raised by my mom and my stepdad who they met when I was two. And he's my dad. He's white. You know, I had a a father in my life, but, uh, when I got into my twenties, I started asking questions about where did I come from? And, you know, what's the heritage and people would always mention my, you know, people were like, where are you from? And, I know they're talking about my skin and I never had an answer for them. And that's like, it's a sadness, you know, to not to have this same question. And every time it's just like, I don't know, I don't know, I don't know. So I kind of resolved to find the guy and it was a long, the show is about the kind of process of like seeking the guy out and finding him and then deciding to go and meet him. But then also reconciling that with the relationship I have with my stepdad, who is my dad who raised me and, uh, because I'm not looking for a new dad. I'm just looking for my own history, you know? So I had to kind of, there's a, there's a different relationship with my stepdad who raised me and the show explores both of those and like nature versus nurture, you know, am I more like my dad who raised me or am I more like this Colombian guy who had sex with my mom 32 years ago? Fantastic. I don't know if you've ever meant uh, read or came across Robert Kiyosaki, who talks about two dads, um, his rich dad and his poor dad. And he actually went on and wrote a blockbuster that a lot of people are basing their financial education on. So who's to know what that significant, um, you know, feature that you have of having two distinctly different fathers that come into your life and um, help you be, do and have the life that you have. But but you mentioning this experiencing of meeting your biological dad, especially for the first time, you know, after 28 years. Now, how did how did that moment sort of um, come to be? And 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 what did that sort of maybe shape your perspective on life uh, and even influence your comedy at some point? It definitely influenced my comedy. I think, you know what? I think the the bigger influence on my comedy was not meeting him, but his absence, you know, and always having to tell the same stories and feeling so 
every time someone asked me feeling that sadness, I got sick of telling the story and then seeing the pity in people's eyes. Like when I would say I never met my dad and seeing how sad that made people. And, you know, also being a young kid and not really like I had a lot of anger towards him when I was younger. And just whenever I would kind of engage with the emotions that I had around the story, I felt like it made people sad and it made people feel sorry for me. And I didn't like that. So I started instead of letting them do that, I feel like with humor, you can kind of control a narrative and make it take a bit more of the power in the conversation back. So I started telling jokes just in my life around that conversation to get out of the feelings of like pity or whatever that people like, I'd start, I I would go like, Hey, I'm taco as a joke. People were like, you know, where are you from? I'm like, eh, fucking never met my dad. My mom got knocked up in South America. Bleh. And uh, those were kind of the first jokes that I would like, you know, to treat that conversation with levity. So his absence had more of a, an impact on my comedy, I think, than actually meeting him. And um, I mean, when I met him, it was, obviously a big moment. Uh, I don't know about you prosper, but like as a guy, I still am not that good at dealing with emotion generally. And like, you know, in the moment, oftentimes if I have a lot of emotion, I won't realize until days or weeks or months later what I was feeling. And I just kind of shut down. So when I went and meet, when I went and met him, I had a lot that I wanted to say to him that I hadn't even really thought about yet. So we just went around for a few days. He lives in Austria, in Vienna. Um, he's spent some time in jail. He's had a very tumultuous life himself. He has another kid. I've got a half brother, this German kid. Um, and I found out all of this stuff. And then we just spent a couple of days kind of driving around Vienna where he lives. And he was trying to show me stuff about his life. But all I wanted to know was like, where the fuck were you when I was a kid getting asked, where are you from? Who are you? You know? But I didn't know how to say that to him. So instead, I just, I didn't say much. But you still have a moment and an opportunity too. Is that something that you'd want to say or has that sort of ship sailed? No, it's definitely still there. He's still, uh, the lines of communication are open. I don't talk to him all the time. Um, I, I like a few months ago, I think was the last time I messaged Jim because, um, and this is something I'm probably going to talk about in my next stand up show. My stepdad adopted me actually like three months ago. Um, we went through the process of having that. And so I messaged Fernando, that's my biological dad. And I told him, Hey, uh, you know, my stepdad is adopting me. I'm going to be his legal son. Um, cause he raised me and I want some acknowledgement of that, but I don't, I'm not trying to cut, you fernando out of my life but i just want you to know like that's something that's happening fantastic um, great stuff and you just mentioned that your dad recently adopted you and i'm supposing this has actually opened up a whole new world for you because um you can now live in the uk now um can you maybe share with um us how this <laughs> unexpected turn of events has impacted your future plans yeah, man. Well, look, uh, this is kind of where I'm at at the moment and has a lot to do with why I am. Um, I feel like I'm in a big period of change in my life at the moment. And what it was, was uh, me and my ex were together and she's moving to the UK. And I said, I'll move with you. And that was kind of why I pulled the trigger on. I'd always thought about whether my dad could adopt me. I never looked into it. But to have that kind of catalyst there, the relationship and knowing that she was going to the UK and that we were going to move together. I, uh, I was like, okay, let me look into if that's actually a possibility because my stepdad's dad was born in the UK. And if you have a grandparent born in the UK, you can get a five-year ancestry visa. So I looked into it and I made it happen. And we talked to lawyers and it was a long three or four month process and, and the adoption went through. And then about a month and a half ago, uh, me and the girlfriend broke up. So like, <laughs> like in one sense, you know, it feels like, oh my God, what a shame, how pointless it was all for nothing. I did all of this work and then the relationship's gone. But on the other hand, even though the relationship didn't work out the way that we had both hoped, it was a great catalyst in my life to do something, to push me to do something that I'd always wanted to do in like having a full legal connection with, um, with my stepdad and like acknowledging, you know, the years of like just him being a dad to me, which was so important. 
Fantastic. And I mean, obviously, given your history of being fired from 14 jobs in your life, I'm <laughs> not surprised that the girlfriend decided to give you the boots there as well. You know, <laughs> now, how have... Oh, Prosper, you're you, you're giving me the boot right now. You're digging the boot in, man. You know how to kick a dude when he's down. Yeah. <laughs> but how have these sort of experiences sort of contributed to the your growth and basically resilience as, as a comedian and now coach? Man, you know, something that I love about stand-up is uh, that I've always loved. And I guess it's like, it's, it's maybe not everyone's approach, but I like to draw from my life and my own stories. And it's almost like a philosophy, right? Like I write every day and I'm trying to write jokes and I'm trying to look at my life and turn that into something that's funny. And like, it's also it's it's great just to do stand up and make people laugh, but it's also a way of training my brain to look at my life and find funny things. So when bad stuff happens that's difficult, like a breakup or you know even something like big, like meeting my biological dad or dealing with those feelings or like quitting drinking, like I did a few years ago, whatever it is, whenever something's difficult, rather than just going, oh that sucks and it's hard. I have this kind of training. It's like a practice, you know, how do I look at that and turn it into jokes? And um, yeah, it's, it's definitely affected my outlook. I, I mean, I always valued like making people laugh, but having that practice of 12 years of just doing it over and over again, I feel like it just, you know, do you know, like when you see something online, like some politics or whatever stupid stuff that people get angry at, Right. And people weigh in and you're reading a Twitter comments thread or LinkedIn or whatever. And you have that moment where you crack your knuckles and you go, you know what? I'm going to tell them what I think. I'm going to give them my opinion. I'm a, I'm a smart, I want to show everyone how smart I am. <laughs> Doing comedy is like a great way of reminding myself, stop, don't do that. Nothing good's going to come of it. Either say something funny or why are you talking? You know, like it just it, it's like a good reminder in those situations when you feel like the anger or the whatever to just be like, I'm going to try and make light of this situation rather than just yelling at people. Well, it's a good thing um, you have the last name Jones because everybody else is always trying to keep up with the Joneses. But I'll tell you something <laughs> now, um, Aiden, what, what, from what you're telling me and from your life story and experience, you have actually managed to do what a lot of people take years and years and years and years trying to achieve. You want to know what that is? You have become the product. You have become the price. You have become what people want. First of all, um, getting to learn from your resilience. And then second of all, really getting to understand how they can connect with their audiences. So many coaches and so many other people or professionals lead with a product, lead with a widget, lead with a certification, and it's got nothing to do with them. If you take that away, they have nothing, but you have already come up with something that is remarkable and something that people are going to be more than happy to pay for. So with your coaching business, what sort of Specific strategies do you employ to help um, professional keynote speakers incorporate humor into their presentations? Right. So, I mean, I guess with 12 years of doing stand up, I've de developed uh, like a system, you know, like I said, I have a story in my life and then I sit down with that story and I apply the different parts of joke structure and story structure and everything that I know about comedy to that story to try and find where the jokes are. So, when I uh, have a client who's a speaker, I get them to send me some of their stuff. If they have a video, a lot of them have like a TEDx talk or some video of them speaking. I'll go through that as if it were my own story and apply those same ideas, the same things about joke structure to their story. I'll write a little bit of an outline myself in my own time. And then we sit down and go through it. And like one of the great things that I've realized it, 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 it demonstrates to me, like it's a reminder for me how much I know. Cause once I start talking about someone else's story and showing them like, you know, you could put a joke here and this is the way that I would write this joke. And this, I won't get into the specifics of it now. Cause I could talk forever, but it's uh, that's basically what I do is I, I kind of lead them by the hand through the process that it's taken me 12 years to develop. So they don't have to go to shitty open mics above pubs in country Victoria. They can just, 
sit there with me and I can show them what I've learned in those 12 years. Fantastic. Now, what sort of advice do you have, you know, for aspiring comedians? I'm not talking about present company, but, um, you know, those that are, um, you know, looking to pursue their career and maybe in stand up comedy and have, you know, 60 specials like Kevin Hart. Um, I'm not even talking <laughs> about anyone. And how can they get a hold of you there, uh, Aiden? Yeah, man, for stand up comedy, I think the only there's there's no substitute for getting on stage, you know, because and I mean, corporate in the corporate world as well, like it's about connecting with the audience, right? So the only way to learn about the audience is to get in front of the audience. You can't this the one thing. It's not like playing guitar where you can sit in your room and practice scales. The scales are getting in front of the audience and you learn about the audience by seeing them and trying to talk to them and then just listening to the reaction, seeing what works and seeing what doesn't work and just trying again and again and again. And, um, I mean, when I, when I work with people, you know, as much as I like, I don't, I don't like to write jokes for people. I like to take them through my process because there's no substitute for finding out what's not like, I can't tell you what you think is funny about your story. You can do that, but I can show you the questions to ask to find out what's funny about your story. Cause I know those questions cause I've asked them to myself, but, um, you know, I can do that all day, but there's no substitute for just getting in front of the audience and trying it. So you got to do that as much as you can, man. And also you're going to have a bad time. Sometimes you get in front of an audience and it'll suck and it'll feel bad. But the more that happens, the less scared you are. And then you start moving like you and you start acting like you on stage rather than just a version of you that you've learned. Absolutely. I love, love, love what you've just said, because a lot of people think success is an event. You just show up on stage. Everybody is throwing whatever they were wearing on their way to the stage <laughs> <laughs> at you there or things of that nature. Hey, man, you know? We just learned a lot about your dream there, you know. <laughs> Well, you never know, man. I already have the microphone, so I'm, you know, a foot in the door there. What do you reckon? <laughs> See, I've also been looking at some of the reviews that you have. Um, you know, there's there's praise about you having effortless charisma. Um, you know, you literally disarming honesty and you've got a sharp and curious mind. And for those that are watching right now, you can actually hire Aiden to be the next MC for your corporate event or awards Sure. Now, what are some of the key elements that you consider when you're actually delivering this sort of top level entertaining performance as an MC? Man, I mean, you got to think about the crowd and what they want, but also not be led by the audience because they're paying for you, you know, like, I feel like a lot of people get caught up in like, okay, who's in this room? How can I write a joke about them? You know, how can I like if I'm at a bank, I got to do a joke about banks or if I'm at a, if I'm performing to people who, you know, own bars, I got to do a joke about bars and that's great as an opener, but eventually people, I think really want to connect with the person who's on stage. So think about the audience, but then think about how you can relay your story and your message to the people in front of you. So like, here's a, I, I really learned a lot. I lived in the UK for a couple of years when I was in my early twenties. And uh, I was 23 to 25 years old. So pretty young. And I was doing a lot of shows in like kind of country club settings and like semi-corporate settings and like places where people were a lot older than me. The median age of the room might be 40, 50 years old. And at the start, it was really intimidating because I was like, man, I'm just this young guy, wow. you know, I'm still like partying quite a bit. What do I have to share with these people? But eventually what I realized is like, I have people in my life who are that age and they love me and they find me funny and I can make them laugh. So all I need to do is figure out what makes them like, what about me makes those people in my life laugh and then just try and embody that when I go on stage. So it's like, I guess whenever I'm in front of a group of people, I just think about, and I've been on stage enough times that I've been in front of a lot of different groups of people. What about me? Can those people relate to? And you start to get to some general themes. Like when I talk about meeting my biological dad, probably a lot of people don't have the story of never having met a biological parent, but everyone can relate to themes of asking who they are, feeling like they don't fit in, feeling like they don't know, you know, something about their history or themes of family or the kind of disruption in the family unit. So when I tell my unique story, it's my story, 
but it's connecting to people in a much more broad sense with the themes underneath it. I don't know if that makes sense. Does that make it sense? It does. It does. While you were talking about that, I actually started thinking because you start, started using humor to sort of deflect the child, childhood sort of insults and whatever the kids were throwing at you, the bullies mm -hmm. at school and things of that nature. Even though I don't quite relate to that, but I also have a, a, a time in my life when my mom actually died on the 1st of January, the year 2000. And for me to you know, deal with that sort of pain, I started joking that my mom was not Y2K compliant. So <laughs> you can imagine That's really funny, that, man. that really got me by. And as a kid, I just started growing up and I was like, yeah, what do you think would have happened? She was not Y2K compliant. And that just became, you know, my thing of dealing with that. So that would have been your way of dealing with the uh, name calling and things like that. But talk about name calling. People were calling you names, and one of those names actually got you a kiss. So obviously, it worked out for the best. I mean, your nickname was Taco for a while when you were younger. And does that childhood nickname still play a role in your um, comedy or personal life today? Besides the uh, show that you did that you named Taco, was it Taco Tuesdays? Yeah, Taco. <laughs> man, man, people still call me Taco and I love it. You know, I love a nickname. I don't know if it's, I notice a lot of the people I grew up with, maybe it's just like, you know, the, the kind of crowd that I grew up with, but everyone had nicknames and I think it's fun. I don't introduce myself as Taco anymore because I don't know, there's something about sometime in my mid twenties, I started to think, you know, you can't be a, like a, a full man out in the world introducing yourself as Taco. But there's a legacy of that nickname from the people who knew me when I was that age, um, who still call me that name. And there, there's a sense of like familiarity in it that I really love. Fantastic. Well, man, we're did you ever have about... a nickname? Oh, sorry. I was just going to say, did you ever have a nickname? Oh, <laughs> I had a lot of nicknames, but they were all in my language. At some point, I was actually called Zeus. Uh, oh, sick. <laughs> but... I digress. That's um, a, a story for another day. But man, thank you so much for your time. I mean, just one more thing. Uh, look at her head. Um, you know, we've, we've looked at your past. We've looked at your, you know, teenage mishaps and your fight with nature and everything else that came along with it. What, what are your future aspirations and goals, maybe as a comedian or as a coach or as a podcast host now that people uh in my audience are now in your world what can they expect from taco i mean aiden <laughs> you can call me taco brother you can call me anything you like um i my goals are three i got three main things that i'm working towards at the moment first is the coaching business i want to uh show people what i can do in the corporate world and i want to help people like i see so many people with great stories who it just feels like they don't quite know how to convey that story to an audience so i want to help people give voice to their stories and the things that they care about um, with the skill set that i have that's one two I want to build the podcast that I've just started, Still Not Drunk, uh, which is a podcast where I interview mostly comedians and people from the uh, alcohol-free world. Um, we share an alcohol-free drink and talk about life, just kind of like what we've done here, talk about uh, where we grew up in our childhoods and the challenges that we've faced and then how we deal with those challenges while we share an alcohol-free drink. Um, and then thirdly, I just want to keep doing stand-up, man. I want to keep getting better. I want to learn more about stand up. I want to watch different stand ups and uh, I'm writing a new show now, which will be my sixth hour of stand up comedy and I'm touring it to Edinburgh and then the Australian festivals. And um, I mean, that's just an ongoing process. Doing stand up for me is like breathing in and out and I'll do it forever. So that's always going to be a part of my life. Well, fantastic, man. I really appreciate your time um and you sharing your incredible journey with us your unique insights and your invaluable humor with us today it's been an absolute pleasure having you here on the online prosperity show man man thank you very much for having me prosper it's been a joy i appreciate it absolutely and to our listener be sure to check out aiden's debut stand-up special taco on amazon prime and tune into his podcast still not drunk uh i don't know how long that's gonna last but um, he promises he is going to grow that show. And remember, finding the comedy 
um, in your own stories can truly bring prosperity and joy in your lives. It's been Prosper. Thank you so much for tuning in. And um, yes, keep keep the funny on. Keep the happy smiles out there. You never know who might you might inspire. Bye for now.